Hey everybody, today I want to show you how to sugar feed. Now it's not that hard of a concept, mainly you just worry about the ratios with uh, sugar water mix. Um, also want to introduce my new co-host Tony. So Tony is completely made out of alpaca fur, he's also on the intro video. Uh, he was a gift from my sister-in-law and brother-in-law from Salt Lake City. So it's, he's kind of my reminder that he is my alpaca and one day I will have more. So, with him being a goal in mine and a co-host, uh, I'll go on a sugar mix. So, I mentioned last time I'm in northeast Florida uh, and it's the end of January. So, our nectar season here really starts kind of uh, early to mid-January, depends on the year, and it starts with the maple bloom. So, uh, the maple trees start producing and that's what really kicks off the bees going out and actually collecting and foraging and getting enough nectar. So once that starts, uh, means the dearth, the winter dearth is over for us. Uh, so we want to uh, supplement feeding. And sometimes they won't take the sugar water, which is fine. Sometimes they will. Uh, at this point, uh, I still feed because I'm not collecting any of this honey yet. As uh, I start to put the honey supers on later on in the season, that's when I, I cut feeding. So with it being early in the season, um, I'll do a one-to-one -one sugar water ratio. So that means by weight I'll do four pounds of sugar to about half a gallon of water. So a gallon of water uh, is roughly about 8.3-ish pounds. So I mix, luckily these sugar bags come in four pound increments. So it makes it perfect for mixing into half a gallon. So that's four pounds of sugar to four pounds of water. And I already have some mixed up. I want to go out and kind of show you how I feed the bees. Um, there uh, is a cold front coming through. It's uh, overcast and kind of windy. It kind of did a little sprinkle earlier. So I'll probably try to be quick with the bees because they'll be a little moody. But uh, so that's the solution that I'm giving them now. And basically what this one-to-one -one solution represents is it's uh, very similar to nectar that the bees go out and forage and get from the flowers. Uh, it's a lot thinner. Now, there's also a two-to-one solution, which is very popular. And this is what we do during, like, dearth time. So in Florida, it's, like, July to August, or in winter time, right? So, well, what we call winter. Uh, about early-ish November to mid-December or early January, whenever that, those maples start blooming. So two, ratio two to one, uh, simulates more like what they would store of honey. So it's, I mean... It's a little bit thicker, it uh, kind of sustains them a little bit better. So two to one is just, so eight pounds of sugar to this four pounds of water. It's the same thing. So this pitcher has a little kind of hand pump, um, which kind of helps uh, mix stuff up. This two to one solution, you might want to use more, more uh, like the water should be warm or, you know, not like super hot. Especially if it's really hot, obviously you don't want to put it straight from it being hot onto the bees. Uh, so you want to give it a little time to cool down if you do mix it up. I've never had a problem with mixing the solution by hand. You know, it might take a little bit more and sometimes you have a little sugar residue, uh, but it, it's not too horrible. Um, there's another one, there's a gentleman in the bee club uh, that I'm part of that uh, he started feeding, he had a 60-40 solution. So, uh, it's a little bit less than two to one, but more than one to one, and he lived by it. So he said that those, uh, so the sugar and the nectar are, uh, are that's the carbohydrate source, and that's what kind of spurs them into making more wax. So even during the summer dearth time, um, where dearth is just when uh, no nectar is really being produced by the environment around you, and usually that's when we supplement the bees. So. He would say even during the dearth time, feeding them that 60% sugar to 40% water, they were still building new wax, which is not common. Um, and he was still being able to do splits and just, he was doing a little supplementing of pollen and everything. But uh, that's, maybe that's more advanced. But I just wanted to kind of throw that out there because that is methodology. And of course, you know, there's a saying and it varies a little bit, but um, ask 10 beekeepers and you'll get 11 different opinions. And beekeeping is like that, but beekeeping is very friendly and people want to truly desire to help. So before I take up too much time and it gets any darker, 
Uh, I want to just kind of show you my four hives I have going on, just how I feed them. Uh, the two length troughs are on top, and uh, I do have to open up the top bars to get in, and it's a really simple feeding uh, system. Um, coming up, I uh, next week, if I have a chance, I really want to build swarm traps. So my swarm traps I'm going to build are basically a smaller version of my top bar hive. So with my swarm trap measurements, should be able to build a full size uh, top bar hive with my dimensions. And I'll talk more about that as I build it, like kind of what the dimensions of the top bars mean. But I also want to get the cost and the you know the pricing and everything on, uh, just to give a, an example of what it costs to build one. Swarm traps are uh, useful, you know, for me as a beekeeper, I think every beekeeper should have a swarm trap because if you, for some reason, if the bees swarm and you're not paying attention, they are gonna find their way possibly to somebody's house and then they have to hire somebody or they have to cut out and do it themselves. And I think swarm trapping your yard is just a responsible thing that a beekeeper should do. And if you don't have the time or don't want to, somebody in your bee club would probably be more than happy to put up a swarm trap in your yard. But like I said, I, I think it's uh, a very good thing to do, even if you're not actively trying to cast swarms around your area. But uh, I'll get more into that next week, hopefully. Um, so next scene you should see, Tony won't be out there because he doesn't have a bee size uh, bee suit or an alpaca size bee suit, but I'll be at the bee house and hopefully not getting attacked by them because they do not like this kind of weather. Thanks so I'm going to start with the top bars first, and basically the top comes off. You have, it's called a top bar because you have all of these bars down, and I cut all mine the same, but again, I'll talk about that next week when we build the swarm trap. So the bees' entrance is in the front, and I always like to work from the back, so I'm going to slowly pry some of these bars up. Now I know from just knowing this hive, uh, comb stops at about here-ish, so I'm good kind of uh, pulling these up like this and not uh, being too careful. So if you come and see how I have these in, so it's, it's not too technical. So these jars, can you see the wood on the bottom? So I just pull the empty jars out. And at the bottom, I have these little strips of wood. And actually, at this point, the bees have propolized them. And they just sit on top so of the screen. Difficulties with my other phone storage, so we're trying it again. So I went ahead and closed this up. I got another one. So I don't want to walk around this side. Uh, walk around. I'm going to fill these up. These are the ones that I took out of here. It's the same concept in this hive as it is in the last one. So I have this pitcher of sugar water. Top. And put it in. So I'll fill it up. I'm not too worried about the, the mildew. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, the bees drink out of uh, mud puddles and all kinds of stuff. So uh, I think a little bit of uh, algae or whatever that is on it doesn't hurt them. Alright. So I'll fill those up. Close them back. I like to have it the jars ready before I open up the hive just in case I get into the hive and they're a little bit uh, ill-tempered for the day or something like that or like the weather is today where it could rain at any second. This one again I know it is uh, pretty much empty until probably a few bars in. Had some cross combing in these. So how I deal with cross combing, which is basically with these top bars, the bees start to connect the bars and start going all crazy. I wait till winter when they empty all the honey out of it and all the reserves, and then I'll chop them out then and kind of adjust it. Uh, there's also a checkerboarding method you can do uh, as and just start adding them to the front and pushing that stuff to the back. So, Empty jar, empty jar. Mom, you want to get a look at these, uh, just how I set them in there. And basically the jars will just sit on these sticks. And they're big enough, and there's one over here. It's big enough for uh, the, the bees just to be able to get under there and get the sugar water. And if you can see, 
and you get down in the hive, you can see the girls at work on that, that yeah. last bar. So that's a good population, especially because uh, that's the last, uh, I guess, bar of uh, wax. So you can tell the bees are working that. They're probably getting to the point where they're going to start uh, drawing some more, some fresh comb, which is good. That's what we want to see. All right. So I set these jars, and I prefer to have one to three holes in it. Uh, I don't go, I used to go crazy and put all kinds of holes in it, but the bees can drain that out faster and it's been recommended by some of the bee inspectors in Florida just to do, you know, one to three holes. So I set these right on top of the wood, right on top of the board, just like that. And the good thing about having these screen bottoms, if it drips, it uh, just goes down and it doesn't make a mess inside the hive. Another thing that I found is very useful about these. During the dearth season, we have a lot of, you know, robbing can occur or uh, yellow jackets are an issue that get into the hive and can stress it out or just, you know, mess it up or destroy it. So instead of being attracted to the front of the hive, I tend to notice a lot of yellow jackets underneath on the screen, just trying to get the residual that drips off versus trying to get in the hive, right? So they're just, they're, they're almost distracted. It's like a distraction technique to kind of think that they can get to the sugar water, but they can't. So that's, that's pretty useful and, uh, and as far as I'm concerned. So it's a quick process, um, usually towards the end of the season when they start building all of these uh, wax pieces or the, the bars, uh, I will have to move the sugar water back. I've been at the point before where I've actually had to not be able to feed them. But if they have that much of a population then they can easily get honey and everything like or nectar from the, the resources uh, if it's ever a problem you can external uh, like in a chicken waterer with some marbles in it so the bees won't drown or I've seen some bucket ideas but you don't want to external feed anywhere near your beehives because that will trigger that uh, that robbing uh, mechanism in them so they'll all swarm to that they'll kind of go crazy get frenzied and if they're closer to the other hives it could cause issues I prefer internal or on top feeders uh, versus like some people use the entrance feeders. Uh, I know one gentleman in the bee club that does that and they, they're great, you know, for him. Uh, I worry about robbing because that uh, entrance feeder, basically uh, all of that, you know, that grouping that the bees will do or that uh, they'll smell that, that, that sugar water and they'll start getting at the entrance and once they're in the entrance, you know, they can get all through the hive. So I don't like it. Uh, just from my experience. Some people love it and it works better. Alright, so that one's done. And this is what I usually mix my stuff up in uh, if I uh, don't use a pitcher. So I know my solutions usually one of the, like this rib is about where I need to fill the sugar up with. Uh, just as you can see, I've used this for a long time. Uh, we used to, kids used to drink a lot of apple juice. So that's where I got these jars, or these uh, things. So, uh, Here's how I do the, the top feeders on my lane straw pots. So, I just pull them off and once I do, you'll probably see bees. And I don't like to work with gloves because my fingers just don't work like that. Um, so if you ever don't wear gloves, make sure you're not wearing rings or anything like that. Because if you get stung and it starts to swell up, you're going to have an issue. So, probably see them kind of start coming up. No, well, not too much. You usually get a few. I'll gently tap it let them fly back down to the bottom. And I broke my rule and didn't have any ready. So I'm gonna open this up real quick. And if you want to, Mom, can you get a, a view on the bees inside? So uh, the bees are in there. Sometimes they come up a lot more and you'll see it'll be hard to get the jar back on. Uh, usually like today, they're, they're being very docile and very nice. So it's gonna be easy. Um, if, depending on the hive attitude, if they start going crazy, sometimes I've had to smash a bee or two, which I usually feel guilty about, but it happens as being a beekeeper. Um, just to get this jar back on before more come out. And if there's a few left out when I get done, then I'm okay with it. They'll eventually find their way back. Take this. And this is something to look out for too, so this is good. With these three holes, the bees, if they don't need it, sometimes they'll propolize these shut. 
So one way is to get a toothpick and open these back. Uh, a, basically how this works is once you turn it over, it's kind of like a durable hamster feeder. It builds this vacuum so no more comes out. Maybe a few drops, but it forms little water droplets and that's what they get to. So indicator that something was wrong is when I turned it over and nothing came out. So I don't have a toothpick on me. So what I'll do is for the sake of this video, I'll put this back on. Let <coughs> come out. That's why you center your eyes. Mistakes are part of beekeeping, so I'm 100% okay with it. So this lid has a couple inside of it, a couple holes, and you can see that they're open. So I will put this on here, give them what I got, and they're eagerly, anxiously awaiting. And screw this on top. And throw this in. You can see that those drips, the bees will clean all that up and I will put it down. I will also fix my top bar that fell down. And I'll continue to feed this one. So, key here is right now I'm feeding them that one-to-one -one solution, trying to get them ready, get them producing. Uh, when they start bringing in that uh, nectar from external environment, that's when they kickstart the queen laying eggs, so the population's gonna increase. So us simulating that, giving them that one-to-one -one sugar water is what triggers that also. So them getting the nectar and getting this sugar water mixture, it really tells that queen to start producing. You know, spring's right around the corner. We can get nectar, so make these. So that's what I have today. Like I said, next time we're gonna work on uh, swarm trapping or making swarm traps, talk a little bit more about swarms. Uh, I love it. It's free bees and I like to do things cheap. So we'll talk to you then. And I appreciate my mom for filming my beekeeping video. Uh, my, my mom still helped me out in my mid-30s. So, appreciate it, mom. Thank you. Nobody got stung in the case of this, so no bees died. Until next week.